Frank, if you okay. need. Okay, great. If you need a pointer. Well, thank you, Claudio. And uh, it, Claudio has really given most of the points that I'm going to make in my talk, but there's a key difference. Claudio has always been an enthusiast for carotid stenting. And I was an enthusiast in the beginning, way back in the early 90s, because I was an endo enthusiast and I thought surgeons should get into the game. Uh, but I became rather skeptical and I've written rather extensively criticizing the CREST trial because I think like other randomized trials or level one evidence, CREST has been misinterpreted because of the bias of the authors and others. So I guess I am both an enthusiast and a uh, critic of CAS. So I think my remarks, which will be very brief, will uh, complement Claudio's because of our different uh, perspectives which come to the same conclusion. And the title I've chosen for my talk is Despite Current Level 1 Evidence, the outlook for an upsurge in carotid stenting or CAS is bright. Again, I have no, unfortunately, no financial conflicts, but I do have lots of biases. I've been both biased for CAS and biased against it in the past. I think it's fair to say that most interventionalists have been biased uh, for CAS for obvious reasons. And that's reflected in much of their writing in this very controversial area. So despite some opinions to the contrary, I think it's fair to say that carotid stenting and the data in both in Europe and the United States show this, carotid stenting or CAS is currently in design, gen, in decline generally for the treatment of both symptomatic and asymptomatic carotid stenosis. And this is because with symptomatic carotid stenosis patients, the recent randomized trials, that is CREST and ICSS, though CREST doesn't say this, the recent randomized trials, along with population-based studies throughout the world, show a higher stroke rate, stroke and death, with CAS than with CEA. And again, CREST doesn't reach this conclusion. CREST has sort of been interpreted as showing equivalence of CAS and CEA. It really doesn't, because the stroke rate in CREST was also higher with CAS than it was with CEA. ICSS, which is the other recent trial, which wasn't even quoted in the American Heart Association guidelines because of bias, ICSS also shows a similarly higher stroke and death rate with um, CAS than with CEA. So because of those trials and the level one evidence, despite some misinterpretation, the use of CAS both in the United States and throughout the world has declined. That's with symptomatic patients. And with most asymptomatic carotid patients, it's widely believed, and again, I've written extensively on this, that best medical treatment has such low stroke rates that it makes both CAS and CEA unnecessary. And uh, though I've written about that, I've also changed my thinking because of some recent work that makes this statement true now, but hopefully it will not be true in the future. The evidence that CAS or CEA for asymptomatic carotid stenosis, for which most of these procedures are done, certainly in the United States, the evidence that these procedures are really unnecessary is summarized here, and you can see the stroke rate back in 1985 per year was 3.6%, and because of best medical treatment and modification, stopping of smoking, et cetera, it's fallen now to less than 1% per year. And because of that, I and many others believe that most asymptomatic carotid stenosis patients should be treated conservatively. And believe it or not, we've convinced most of the rest of the world to agree with us where they now treat fewer and fewer of these patients. And back in 2009, the patients who underwent CAS in New Jersey 
96% of them were asymptomatic, which to me is, it's, it's not malpractice, it's worse, it's assault. Uh, anyhow, it's criminal. However, despite these remarks, I believe the outlook for CAS is bright because of the three advances which were really beautifully presented by Claudio, uh, which may, has to be proven still, decrease strokes and improve CAS results and make the current randomized trials obsolete. And these three devices, which he nicely summarized, are better embolic protection devices with either, I call it cessation uh, of, or reversal of flow, cervical access with the Silk Road system to avoid the aortic arch and all the problems that occur from that, and produce reversal of flow, and the membrane or mesh covered stents to stop delayed strokes, which Claudio very nicely summarized. And our interest in carotid stenting, as I say, went back to the early 90s when we were convinced that vascular surgeons should get into the, the field. This was one of my carotid endarterectomy specimens as it was removed from the patient. And with, uh, I think the battery on this is a little low, but uh, this was taken out of the patient. We looked at it. And we said, why don't we see the impact of carotid stenting on that plaque? So we put it in a Gore-Tex sheath, mounted it on an introducer system, and then placed it in a water bath, perfused it with saline. This was a very cheap experiment, by the way. Uh, and through this introducer system, using a fluoroscope, we carried out a carotid stenting on this simulated carotid plaque. The Gore-Tex was to simulate the adventitia in the real patient. And then we collected the perfusate on a filter. And this was one of my high-grade carotid specimens. You can hardly see the lumen. It's, it's a pinhole lumen. The beautiful restoration of the lumen in this plaque with carotid with the placement of the stent, but uh, you can see here there's some fronds of the plaque which are uh, left in the lumen. But that procedure and all the others in this old model now produced uniformly these particulate matter. And this work led to all the embolic protection devices which Claudio so very nicely um, showed. Without this work, I don't think uh, the companies would have gone into this as, a, as aggressively. So, again, I believe because of these three advances, and I'll say a, a couple more words about these, although Claudia's really covered it very well, because of these three advances, oh, and this, by the way, is showing these fronds inside the lumen of this stent, and it's as flow is restored through this lumen in a patient, it was believed that these particulate matter protruding through the stent were washed off and caused the delayed uh, emboli and strokes that, that Claudio mentioned. So along come the nice mesh-covered stents. Again, Claudio mentioned the three companies that are producing them. This is one of them, and you can see the mesh here. Uh, and. Uh, I want to say one word more, again, don't want to be redundant, but one word more about the Silk Road system, uh, because it not only avoids the aortic arch, but it produces reversal of flow with all the advantages that Claudio described. And here's the system, again, which he showed. The beauty of it is that it can be placed through a, th a small incision in the neck. The common carotid rather than the internal carotid have to be dissected, clamped, and then this short sheath is put in and the procedure is carried out under reversal of flow and there's a filter in the system so any particles collected during this reversal of flow can be uh, collected and analyzed. And this system really, I believe, uh, is very promising, but it still has to be uh, proven by more work. And uh, there are actually three studies in addition to, in addition to the Roadster, one the proof in Europe, another one, the, the, uh, another one in Europe, the Tesla, 
And all three have shown promising results in high-risk patients for routine carotid stenting. So, for symptomatic and asymptomatic patients, if these three advances decrease the CAS stroke rates, CAS would be more competitive to CEA and would replace CEA more widely than it currently does. For the asymptomatic patients, remember I said they aren't being done as being treated invasively as often as they used to be because of the fact that best medical treatment makes their stroke rate so low, if we could pick from all those asymptomatic patients, those few, probably around 5%, that are really at a high risk of having a stroke if treated medically, then it would justify invasive treatment in those patients. And there are on the horizon methods to uh, detect risk patients. One is analysis of continuing microemboli uh, with TCD, microemboli to the brain. Another, there are a whole bunch of better methods, uh, three-dimensional duplex and so forth, to evaluate the plaque. MRI and CT, better analysis of plaque. Silent MR and CT, infarcts in the brain. All four of these have been shown to correlate with a higher risk of stroke in these asymptomatic patients in the work of Nicolaides, Kakos, and others show that you can pick out asymptomatic patient groups which don't have this low, less than 1% stroke risk per year, but have a greater than 10 or 12%. And I believe those patients probably justify invasive treatment, which is a change in uh, my thinking. So again, if these high-risk asymptomatic patients could be selected by these methods, Clearly, they would benefit from either a CAS or CEA in addition to best medical treatment, thus increasing the number of patients requiring CAS. However, there's one reservation to all this, and that is the efficacy of these three methods for decreasing CAS stroke rates and improving asymptomatic patient selection must be proven by appropriate clinical trials. So my conclusion is, I'm sure Claudia would agree, that despite this reservation, I believe, projecting the future, the outlook for carotid stenting or CAS is bright, and I think all vascular surgeons and other vascular specialists shouldn't throw CAS in the wastebasket, as some are doing, but they should prepare for these improving CAS results. So anyhow, those are my remarks, and happy to discuss anything.